So as I, as I alluded to in the introduction, uh, we're going to have, I'm going to give you, you're going to hear four and a half hours from me on some a basic overview of the whole heliophysics system. And it's, it's going to be rather superficial. So actually, the thing to pay attention to isn't your specialty, but everything else. I will probably not do justice to your own specialty. Um, and the, the way we, we conceived of this was just being able to come up with the answers to some of the basic questions. If you, if you haven't asked yourself them, you should. Uh, like, why does the sun have a magnetic field? Why do planets have magnetic fields? Um, I should also say I posted the lectures when I was 90% finished with them, or I thought I was finished with them, but it turns out I was not. So the versions I show you here are going to differ slightly from what you have. Um, we, will up, we will update them so that they're the final versions. But the other thing I, you, know, you do notice when you're doing this, and probably it's taken me to this point in my career before I really appreciated it to this level, is how much inner, inner linkage there is between these. So I would be making the talk on the ionosphere and realize I had to modify my talk on the dynamo and on the corona because they are interlinked. They're not separate areas. So when I realized what aspects of the corona were relevant to the ionosphere, I had to go back and modify. So uh, just be alert. You're, you're mostly going to be in the right uh, ballpark when you uh, follow along. But what's up here might be slightly different. Anyway, the first question at hand is why planets and the sun have magnetic fields at all? And you probably already have some idea of the answer, but let's just uh, show you. Let's see, this is my laser, yes. Um, it was said that the uh, Jovian aurora was not part of heliophysics. It most certainly is. And we're going to talk about the magnetic field on Jupiter, on the sun, on Uranus, Neptune, uh, Saturn, Earth. There's Saturn, some aurora. You, can, of course, can't always see the magnetic fields. These are fake magnetic fields from the sun. Uh, so the question is, why all these things have magnetic fields? And what about the things that aren't here? Where's Mars and, and Venus? Um, you probably know the answer in one word. That is a dynamo. So that's just a, a jargon word, right? The reason everything has a magnetic field is it has some kind of dynamo. But of course, that just raises the next question, what is a dynamo? And the dynamo, we're going to get into the details of how a dynamo works without being super complicated here. But we, we have three basic ingredients we have to have in order to have a dynamo. And every example you saw there has the ingredients. We need an electrically conducting fluid of some kind. Okay. The fluid has to be in motion, and in fairly complex motion, and it must be fairly vigorous motion. Now, the differences across our solar system come in what this conducting fluid is. So for the sun, and I will also allude to all variety of other kinds of stars, the conducting fluid is a plasma, ionized plasma. Uh, but for terrestrial planets like the one we're standing on, it's actually liquid iron in the core of the Earth. Uh, for Jupiter and Saturn, uh, the gas giants, it's metallic hydrogen. Okay, not a plasma. It's actually under extremely high pressure. But it, it is uh, an electrical conductor. And for the ice giants, it's ionized water. So vastly different things. And yet they all do the same thing because they are electrically conducting. Uh, complex motions. In every case, they're basically from one thing, turbulence. Okay, so the fluid is somehow put into turbulent motion. And I hope to convince you, if you don't already believe this, that that is sufficient to generate a magnetic field. Uh, rotation is a topic of, of much discussion. Uh, it is not actually required in order to generate a magnetic field. It's just required to generate a magnetic field that has sort of global organization. So every example you saw there has this, although I would, I would argue, and we have argued 
uh, among solar physicists for a long time that there's a layer of the sun that's generating a magnetic field that's completely disorganized. And yet it's a very interesting magnetic field because it does not sense the solar rotation. Uh, so rotation breaks the mirror symmetry and gives you this large scale organization. Uh, and finally, we need the motions to be vigorous. We need them to really be able to do stuff. And there's one figure of merit, and I'll come back to this a few times. It's called the magnetic Reynolds number. And it's basically a product of the, of the speed of the motion, the size of the object, and the conductivity. Okay, so if you, you have something that's not a conductor, the magnetic Reynolds number is zero, and you don't get a dynamo. Uh, conductivities of these things vary greatly. What we in heliophysics always have going for us is this size thing, right? These are all, even the Earth is really big. The sun is enormous, but the Earth is big. So size always comes to our rescue here, and the velocities are going to be very different. So this is what we need to have a dynamo. So let me go into what a dynamo is. And you can probably see with conducting fluid here, this is ultimately going to involve magnetohydrodynamics. And I, a lot of you are probably very comfortable with magnetohydrodynamics. Others, not so much. I want you to understand how a dynamo works without saying you need to understand MHD to get the answer right. So I want to think of a really simple toy. And it literally looks like a toy. And it has the ingredients I mentioned, kind of. Okay, It is a simple conducting disk, like a copper disk, with a wire connecting the axle to the rim. How many of you have seen this explanation before? It's called a homopolar dynamo, John has. Nobody else. We can basically, you, you have to squint your eyes in a way to see why this has the same properties that I said a, a dynamo has to have. It's not a conducting fluid. It's, in fact, a conductor with several parts. Okay? That seems to be an, as much as you really need. Fluid is an easy way to have lots of moving parts moving independently. Uh, but if you could make two pieces of metal, you've got it. Um, you need complex motions. And in this case, what you do is you need to move the parts in a, in a way that's separate from one another. You can't just take a single piece of metal and spin it and expect it to generate a magnetic field, that ain't going to work. Uh, but what this does not have uh, that a lot of people might think is important for generating a magnetic field, it doesn't have any magnets. It's, it doesn't have any like permanent magnets involved in it. right? It's just a copper disk. Uh, it doesn't have batteries. It doesn't even have net charge. right? So people will start to explain dynamos in terms of charges moving. And really, if you ever you know, you, you remember studying circuits. You can think of charges, but mostly you think of currents, right? Which are moving charges, but the, the things themselves are not charged, right? This copper disk doesn't have a net charge. The wires don't have a net charge. And yet, this thing will generate a magnetic field if I turn it. And here's the trick. You kind of have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So you have to say, well, if there were a magnetic field going up like this, and I spun the disk, then the spinning disk would see a motional EMF. I teach physics to undergraduates. So I remember I go through all these, all these lectures on motional EMF. It's the velocity of the conductor crossed with the magnetic field. V cross B gives us an electric field that goes from the axle to the rim. Okay. Now, um, well, let's, let's back up and just say, so what's that do? That's going to drive a current around this wire. And that current is essentially going to create a magnetic field. And I've made the wire go in just the right direction that it generates a magnetic field in the same direction that it started with. So in other words, it amplifies the magnetic field it started with. And if we have a stronger magnetic field, then I'll get a stronger electric field, which will drive more current, which will give me more magnetic field. And the whole thing will just run away. So no matter how weak the magnetic field is I start with, I will end up with a, a seriously strong magnetic field. All I needed was this conducting wheel and a wire to basically tap the axle and the rim. Okay. Any questions on this setup here? We're gonna go through a few things. Yeah. Uh, yes. So what happens if you 
Ah, excellent question. Uh, let's, let's do a little bit more, and then I'm going to ask you to tell me what you think happens. But let's, let me justify, just use circuit analysis, right? Just V equals I on R kinds of stuff, and demonstrate that this really does work. And so the first thing I have to do, I write this as a voltage, but it's actually the EMF, the electromotive force, and it's the electric field integrated from the axle to the, to the rim. And the electric field is V times B. I've, uh, I'm doing the, I've, I've taken all the directions into account, so we just have to worry about the magnitudes. Uh, and V is actually the rate omega I'm spinning the disk at times the radius R. So I have to integrate basically omega Oops, I dropped, uh, yeah, omega RDR. So I do the RDR, and I'm going to get 1 half R squared. Now I've combined B and R squared into the flux. So the voltage, or the EMF drop from axle to rim, is basically the rate I'm spinning the disk times the flux, the magnetic flux threading the disk. Okay, that's the voltage. Now we have to do some circuit analysis. IR, that is the resistive voltage drop through the entire circuit, right? We have to picture this as a single circuit, is the EMF. And I calculated this that's called the motional EMF. That's the EMF that I generate from moving the disk. And then we have a back EMF. You all remember back EMF from circuits? It's basically minus the inductance times the time derivative of the, elect of the current. Uh, back in the old days, we used to have uh, cars that had something known as an alternator. And this is how it generated sparks in your ignition. Right? It used the back EMF to generate a very high voltage because you turn the current off very rapidly, and you get a large EMF. Right? So this is, this is basically a circuit. Uh, I've set IR equal to the EMF. Same thing you do when you have a battery. I don't know if you remember. your. Professors always insisted a battery does not generate a voltage, right? Does everyone, did everyone have that drilled into them? It generates an electromotive force. It's an EMF. That's chemical. There's no chemistry here. This is simply me turning the disk, and the, the circuit itself resisting my, my attempt to change its current. Uh, finally, I'm going to say, well, the flux through the disk is related to the current. And the relationship of flux in one thing to current in another is a mutual inductance. So that flux is basically the mutual inductance times the current. So the whole circuit works in terms of a current, a resistor, a current, a mutual inductance, and a time rate of change, and a self-inductance. And I'll rewrite that as the time rate of change of the current is a big factor here times the current. It's basically a growth rate times a current. Uh, now, this factor involves the generation piece, that is me turning the disk, and what is essentially a dissipation piece, the resistor dissipating the current or resisting my ability to drive it. Okay, So we have the two pieces, but they both go into how this current is going to change in time. Now we solve a very simple differential equation. The time rate of change of current is this factor times current. The current grows or decays exponentially okay, in time. So we have some initial value and then e to the gamma t. This will be exponentially growth if gamma is greater than 0. Right? It could be negative, in which case it's just exponential decay. It's kind of what you'd expect. You had current in a resistor, it's going to decay away. But in fact, and so this is an LC circuit, essentially, except this part of the L is, uh, involves a generation term. So now we see that in order to make this thing grow, I need to turn the wheel this fast. Omega has to exceed the ratio of the resistance to the mutual inductance. That's a inverse time scale. If you remember from circuits, L over R is the decay time for an LR circuit. This is a mutual inductance. So this is the speed I have to spin this disk at to make the whole thing work. Now, if we wanted to approach something like a planet, I can start thinking about, well, this 
spinning disk is just the velocity the conductor's moving divided by the size of the conductor. The resistance is 1 over the conductivity, sigma, times the size of the conductor. The mutual inductance is always mu naught. I'm using MKS. I'll go back and forth, I'm afraid. But uh, inductance is always size. I often ask students what their self-inductance is. Anyone know their own self-inductance? Wow. If you had a baseball card, what would you put on it for self-inductance? You know, that's right. <laughs> Plays shortstop. Self-inductance is, it's probably about a tenth of a Henry, a micro Henry. Because it's basically your size times mu naught, which is tenth of a micro Henry, 10 to the minus 7, or a micro Henry, times your size. That's always what self-inductance is. It's also what mutual inductance is. So it's easy enough to analyze this. You put it all together, and you get V over L has to exceed this, or mu naught sigma L, the velocity V, must exceed 2 pi. This is the actual definition of the magnetic Reynolds number of this thing. So two ways to think of this. One is the very simple toy picture. If I want to generate a magnetic field, I've got to spin this disk fast. How fast? This fast. Okay. Tell me the resistance. Tell me the mutual inductance. I'll tell you how fast you have to spin the disk. The more abstract MHD way to think of it is I want to generate a magnetic field. I need the magnetic Reynolds number to exceed, in this case, you know, this is all twiddly math, 2 pi. So I need a magnetic Reynolds number that's, that's big, bigger than 6. So far, so good? So let's, before we answer the question that was posed, uh, let's just make a few observations. One is, I can actually start with a magnetic field that goes in the opposite direction. Okay? And then my EMF will be in the opposite direction. My current will flow in the opposite direction. And it will amplify magnetic field in the opposite direction. So the whole thing works oriented in the opposite direction. That's obvious from here, too. If I is negative, I naught is negative, I generate negative current <laughs> that grows exponentially. Right? No problem with that. So it works in either orientation. In fact, it, one of the things that we'll, we'll come back to is these dynamos seem to have two operating modes. Okay, We can generate magnetic field this way or this way. Another thing, though, is if I flip this in the mirror, well, let me, let me back up and say, if I spin the wheel in the opposite direction, the EMF will now be in the opposite direction. That will generate current in the opposite direction, which will oppose the magnetic field that I started with. The whole thing will fail will not generate a magnetic field. So spinning it in the opposite direction leads to a non-dynamo. If I flip it in the mirror and spin in the opposite direction, or spin in the direction that I see in the mirror, it works again. So these are, these are some properties of this toy. And we're going to see that they're shared by all the dynamos that we're familiar with. That it will work in these two R orientations. If I change the sign of the velocity, it won't work. If I change the sign of the velocity and flip the whole thing in a mirror, it will work again. So now, given this analysis, any thought on when this thing will stop amplifying magnetic field? Right? It can't grow exponentially to the end of time. What problem would I encounter with this toy? Well, I have omega, and I can, as long as omega is bigger than this, dissipation will never, right? The dissipation scales in the same way as the generation. They scale together. So, <laughs> so unless I slow down my spinning, OK, and then drop below this, it should just keep going. And why would I slow down my spinning? is not the Hall effect, I'm afraid. Good thinking, no? What? Lin's law. Uh, sorry, if, uh, um, that's what self-inductance is. 
basically Lenz's law. Yeah, so that, that's in there, right there. Well, yeah, um, it turns out if you want to build such a toy, all the resistance really comes from there. Uh, so the friction is, is a problem. But does the friction depend on, what does the friction depend on? It, 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 well, depending on what kinds of friction. Kinetic friction, they tell you, doesn't depend on the speed even. Uh, if, if I go into more sophisticated models of friction, it might depend on how fast I'm spinning. But when I start spinning, presumably I've overcome the friction. Now, presumably my breakfast would run out after a certain period of time and I would have to stop. Um, but Sure, why don't, you, why don't you try to decide what you think could stop me, assuming I'm, you know, I have enough, uh, enough food in my gut to, to keep this going. Is there, is there a physics pr property, a physical effect that would say, yeah, you're going you're gonna to fail at some point and your exponential growth will flatten out? So just discuss. Couple minutes. See if anyone. Like I said I teach freshman physics, so I'm not looking for things that my freshman engineering student wouldn't know. Something, as this current gets stronger and stronger, something's going to. Resistance will stay the same, right? I'm, I'm assuming resistance stays the same. Eventually, if it gets up high enough, you're right. I will, I will, my wires will stop conducting the current I want it to. Yeah. But I, I, yeah. What do we? I mean, this, this EMF here. One of the, yeah, one of the things that will happen is I need the magnetic field to penetrate into the disk. And so that, you know, depending on what the conductivity is. But of course, if the conductivity is very high, then my work is, is quite easy for myself. Yeah. Of energy, so yeah, so the energy. So how would he? Why would he need to exert any energy at all? Why does why does the spinner have to? There's friction. Okay, let's say somehow I teach freshman physics. I'm used to saying, let's ignore friction. It's a frictionless disk. Why would he need any energy to spin this thing? I do have ohmic dissipation, so some energy has to be going into this. How does this guy know as he's spinning that he's seeing that he has to supply energy to the ohmic dissipation? It's probably not radiating. This gamma is not going to be in any wavelength. But he doesn't, he's never accelerating. No, no, I can't. Yeah, yeah. We, we know that that has to end. I'm, I'm looking for the physical process. And, and it, it is the energy you supply. So you have to supply the energy that goes into the dissipation. Um, but how, when you're, when you're turning something, what, what thing from freshman physics tells you that you re it requires work for you to turn that? Anyone heard of torque? No? It's, a, it's the force, right? It's not, it's not the energy, it's the force, right? I have to do work against a force. And that force comes from I cross B. That is the force required to move a conductor through a magnetic field if it's carrying current. If it's not carrying current, I don't have any problem. I can keep doing it. In fact, the Hall effect is one of the things that prevents me from having to do any work. If I didn't have this wire here, then 
things would be cool. There'd be no current. I wouldn't have to do any work. This thing, as the current grows, the force I have to work against is going to grow. And we can calculate the, the torque, which is the force times the lever arm, R, which again turns out to look a lot like the uh, EMF. It's the current times the flux. So the higher the current is, the more torque I have to exert. Or if I use the mutual inductance, it goes up as current squared. So as I turn this thing, I'm going to feel a stronger and stronger and stronger force that I have to do work against. The, the power that I have to supply is the rotation rate times the torque. This is power going into turning the disk, which is going as I squared. So yes, this is where I'm going to run out of, of my ability to crank this thing, because the torque has now become bigger than the torque I can supply. That's going to drive the rotation rate down. If I subtract off the ohmic losses, so the power I'm supplying minus I squared R, the ohmic losses into the resistor, I get this familiar little gizmo times I squared. And if you recognize, this is basically gamma times L. So the power minus what I'm losing is gamma times I, Li squared, or the time derivative of 1 half Li squared. And this, again, from freshman physics, is the magnetic energy stored in a circuit. Okay, this is the, the total integral of all the magnetic field due to driving a current through this the circuit. So that's what the self-inductance really is about. It's about size. And the reason it's about size is because it tells you how much volume you have to fill with magnetic field. The bigger you are, the bigger your volume, the more magnetic energy you need. So this difference is basically the amount of work that I'm storing in the magnetic field. As soon as I run out of, of steam and I can't overcome that torque, I will slow down. Okay? And when I do, I will slow down until I get to a criti the critical rate, at which point I'm not adding any more energy to the magnetic field, but I'm still overcoming the dissipation. I still have to keep doing work, but I'm not building up any more magnetic energy. And so the current plateaus. I get to zero growth rate. So this is the point at which dynamos all saturate. When they get to a point that whatever is supplying the energy is able to overcome the dissipation, and it could be, this, it could be friction, uh, but what we're going to focus on is ohmic dissipation, because it has to drive currents around, uh, and nothing more. Because adding extra magnetic field would be adding extra energy, and that's going to take extra work. So this is everything I want out of this toy model. Any, any other questions then before we move on to a real dynamo, a real equation version of a dynamo? Yeah. Rotationally dominated magnetosphere. Well, the magnetosphere, the, um, the magnetic field for the Earth's magnetic field is actually coming out of the core of the Earth. Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's actually what's limiting the field strength of the Earth is essentially we have, well, I'll, I'll, get, to, I'll get to how that works for the Earth. Uh, we can get to how that works for the sun. Uh, but the, the actual magnetosphere, which will be tomorrow's lecture, is essentially just a consequence of this dynamo that's working inside the Earth. Um, but for this toy, yeah, it's, it's basically the, the work that you have to invest in generating the magnetic field and fighting the dissipation eventually is too much. And you always compromise just fighting the dissipation. You basically balance out where you can supply just enough work. And the work has to come from somewhere, either your breakfast or we'll have other sources of energy for planets, uh, which don't eat breakfast, I should say. Uh, so here we go. This is MHD. MHD equations, uh, if you haven't seen them, maybe you've seen fluid equations, continuity of mass, that's a fluid equation. There should be a minus sign there, so it's an erroneous fluid equation. I'll fix that before the final version gets posted. We have a, um, we have a momentum equation, which is basically mass times acceleration. And then we have various forces here. We have the cr pressure gradient. We have gravitational force. This is the viscous force. Uh, viscous stress is sigma. Sorry, it has to do a couple of things. When it's a, a matrix like this, it's the stress tensor. 
When it's a scalar, it's the conductivity. And I have the Lorentz force, J cross B, which essentially J is just curl of B. Okay, so we have all these forces. This is going to be important in saturating the dynamo. And I have some sort of energy equation, which includes, among other things, the ohmic dissipation. Current squared divided by sigma, that's the, the uh, ohmic losses. Finally, I have a combination of Faraday's law, which is that there's Lenz's law, the, the minus sign there. Uh, the time rate of change of the magnetic field is minus the curl of the electric field. In a conductor, that electric field is basically minus V cross B plus the ohmic part. Okay? So this is a complete system. It tells me how to update the density, the velocity, the temperature, and the magnetic field as a fluid. Um, what I, and so yeah, there is the two ways in which the magnetic field is affecting the fluid. Okay, it, it exerts a force through the, uh, through the Lorentz force, and we saw in this past example that that's very important. That's what saturates the dynamo. It's that J cross B, or in that case it was I cross B. Uh, and then the losses that accompany that are basically the ohmic losses. If we start with a situation where the magnetic field is weak, and we're in this situation where the fluid doesn't really feel that back reaction. Right? When I'm spinning that dynamo and the magnetic field is, is exponentially growing and it's still at early phase, then I can get rid of those two pieces. And now we have fluid dynamics like you would study if you were building aircraft. Right? This is just fluid dynamics of, of a neutral non-conducting fluid because the magnetic pieces are irrelevant because the magnetic field is, work, is, is too weak. So you can s imagine solving this. This is a great thing. We're not going to do that. But just imagine you did. Then you have the velocity as a function of time. And you can plug that velocity into this equation. And this is an equation that's linear in the magnetic field. Every term has one magnetic field in it. So if I know the velocity, I can learn what happens to the magnetic field. That's what we did in our little disk dynamo example. I assumed I could spin this disk at a certain speed, and then we could solve for what happens to the current. So this is what's going to happen here. Um, and actually, I can take this. I've just done some vector calculus here, which is one of my hobbies, um, and rewritten the curl in using three terms. Now I've broken out those three terms. So one of them is the advective time derivative of the magnetic field. If I follow the fluid, this is just basically how the magnetic field is changing as viewed by that fluid element. I have these other two terms, which kind of look weird. But what I have to see is they're not taking derivatives of the magnetic field, which we don't know. They're taking derivatives of the velocity, which we do at this stage. So it's really the magnetic field dotted into a matrix. B dotted into a matrix. Okay, so we've gone from MHD to now just, calcul or just um, matrix algebra. So one of the things you could say is if my time derivative is B times a matrix, then I'm going to get growth. Magnetic field is going to amplify if the matrix has positive eigenvalues. All I really have to do is think of a matrix, a velocity field that creates this kind of matrix here, where it has some eigenvalue lambda that has a positive real part. And there's a chance my magnetic field will amplify and grow, as it did in the disk dynamo example. Um, however, I also have this diffusive term. This is the ohmic dissipation. I should have pointed out that eta is 1 over the resistivity with the mu naught. So uh, in fact, if I just if I just look at what that would be, lambda minus or plus eta del squared, lambda is roughly going to be the velocity in this velocity field divided by the length scale on which it's structured. And del squared is going to be minus 1 over the length scale squared. So my growth rate is going to be this, which is 1 minus eta over Lambda nu, this is another version of the growth of the magnetic Reynolds number. More or less the same expression. We, it is exactly the same expression we had before. Again, with my twiddly math, it looks as if 
all the magnetic Reynolds number has to be here is bigger than 1. That's because I've left out some 2 pi's that come from this here. Uh, would be 2 pi squared. But the magnetic Reynolds number must be big. The flow velocity that's generating the positive eigenvalue has to be big enough to overcome the ohmic dissipation. Okay, so here's where the story is very similar. Um, it's also similar that if I change the sine of b, right, I have an eigenvector, but of course we don't care about the sine of the eigenvector. The eigenvector can have either sign, so it's going to grow with the same growth rate. I can change the sign of v and coordinates, and this matrix M will be un unchanged. Reflect it in the mirror, change the velocity sign, same eigenvalues, one of them is positive, still positive, still growth. If I do one of those two things, I change the sign of V, but not the gradient operator, now I have a matrix that's the transpose. And it's not clear that the same eigen, that, uh, sorry, it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's actually going to change the sign here. So lambda will go to minus lambda. That's what's going to happen. Uh, and so my positive eigenvalue is no longer positive, And I'm not sure I will have a growing eigenvalue. Okay? So we'd have to do more work. But this has all the same symmetry properties that my disk has. Um, what kind of flows would have this property that they have a positive eigenvalue? And I've drawn a very simple one here. It basically flows to a stagnation point that are in along the y-axis, out along the x-axis. Right, there it is. Pretty easy to compute the matrix for this. It's basically 1 and minus 1 on the diagonals with whatever the velocity over the length scale that had to go into this. Okay. Really easy to pick out the eigenvalues here. One of them is positive. The eigenvector is basically at 1, 0. That, if I multiply it by this matrix, I get v naught over L times the same vector. v naught over L is the eigenvalue, as promised. So I'm going to get growth, as long as v naught over L is big enough. Uh, what this does to magnetic fields, those of you who've seen MHD, the magnetic field lines are moved with the flow. So if I have a certain, and this is the eigenvector that will grow, if I have horizontal field like this, then this flow is going to bring these field lines, compress them at the axis, and stretch them out. So here's the take home message from all of MHD. What I need to get a positive eigenvalue, and therefore a dynamo, is I need a flow that will have this effect of stretching the magnetic field. People who don't deal with MHD think that that sounds really kind of cartoony. Now I've tried to put some math behind it, but it's really what's happening. These magnetic field lines, according to the MHD equations, do get stronger, and they get compressed and stretched. Okay? Which, if I started with a little circle sphere of ink at any point in here, that ink would also get stretched. So you don't even have to really think about the fate of a magnetic field to know if you have a dynamo. You can think about the fate of ink droplets or milk droplets in cream. Right? As long as they get stretched out, then there's at least one direction where the magnetic field will get stretched out. That means it's getting amplified, it's getting stronger, it's growing exponentially, provided you're stretching faster than the diffusion is destretching. That's what really diffusion is all about. Okay? And the technical term for this process of stretching in a flow field or a dynamical system is called the Lyapunov exponent. That's basically a, a rate of stretching. Um, so what we need in the end is really just a, a flow field that has a positive Lyapunov exponent. And fortunately, I won't give you all the details, but you can show that turbulence does exactly that. Now you have experience with this because if you put your cream into coffee, then it forms this little drop, right? And it will diffuse across the coffee if you give it a couple hours, but your coffee will be cold. Or you can swirl it around, and that little drop of cream gets stretched out. And 
and that's why you get cream distributed throughout your coffee. You're making turbulence do that for you. Okay, so you get this stretching property from turbulence. Uh, what you need for turbulence involves one more dimensionless number. It's actually the Reynolds number, and it looks exactly like the magnetic Reynolds number, except in place of the diffusive, magnetic diffusivity, you have the viscosity. This also needs to be big for us to get turbulence. So in peanut butter, which has a very low Reynolds number, unless you drive it supersonically, uh, you don't get turbulence. But in coffee, which has a very low viscosity, you don't have to stir it very hard, and it'll become turbulent. So you get turbulence whenever the magnetic Reynolds, whenever the real Reynolds number is large. Um, now, the last bit, and this is really hand wavy, somehow my turbulence would stretch the magnetic field in all different directions, right? I'd end up with stronger magnetic field, but kind of totally disorganized. In order to make it organized, one of the things we can do is keep the turbulence in a rotating medium. And the axis of rotation will provide a, a, a sort of organization gives us a direction. And the magnetic field lines will actually be stretched preferentially perpendicular to that axis. They will want to be stretched out perpendicular to the rotation axis, but only if rotation matters. So um, we need the Rossby number to be large. So that's the ratio of the velocity over essentially the velocity of the rotation. Okay, so the uh, the secret here is that the rotation, and here I'm now not talking about a spinning disk, but whatever fluid I have that's rotating, that has to be rotating fast enough. I don't know who, where Rossby got his idea for defining this number, but it's the only dimensionless number that tells us things are really effective when it's very small. Okay? Reynolds number, the, the flow is effective when the Reynolds number is big. The dynamo is effective when the magnetic Reynolds number is big. Rotation is effective when the Rossby number is small. And to give you a simple example of what Rossby number means, we have systems on the Earth that are affected by the Earth's rotation, like hurricanes. In the northern hemisphere, hurricanes all go in one direction because the velocity of the air going around in a hurricane, if I put it here, is small compared to the rotational velocity of the Earth where they are sitting, and therefore they feel the rotation. There's one place, and I'm going to call on, we have two Australians here, at least, two I know of, where people will tell you, oh, in Australia, all the toilets flush in the opposite direction. And is that true? It is not true. Which is basically the Rossby number. The Rossby number is not small. Well, I should say, what you hope, the Earth takes 24 hours to rotate, your toilet should, under good circumstances, flush in less than 24 hours. I was in graduate school. There were some apartments I lived in where that was not true. But <laughs> you, you, in, in, you should call your landlord if your toilet's taking more than 24. If it flushes in the required, in the, in the preferred 10 seconds, it doesn't know the Earth is rotating, so why would it care which direction it's going? That's all encompassed in the Rossby numbers. Okay. So if that's true, then we're going to get some influence on the turbulence, and that's going to organize our magnetic field. And here are some basic parameters, the sun and the earth. We'll get into the more specifics, but I just want to show you that the magnetic Reynolds number for the sun is 10 to the 8. We seem to be good. For the earth, it's 100. It's certainly bigger than 2 pi, so should be good to generate magnetic fields. Uh, the Reynolds number in the sun, 10 to the 10, that's great. For the Earth, it's 10 to the 7 also. Expecting pretty good turbulence in the Earth's core. This is the core of the Earth, I should say. The Rossby number in the Sun, 10 to the minus 2. Yeah. Rotation matters, but not a whole lot. On the Earth, a whole lot. right? One in a million. So the Earth is very strongly dominated by the rotation of the core. So these show us that we're going to have the ingredients. We have. In each case, a conducting fluid. That's captured in the magnetic Reynolds number. We also have complex motions. That's captured in the Reynolds number. We're going to have turbulence. So we should be in Dynamo City. Um, so let's see. Uh, go for another few minutes, and then we can take a break. Um, 
but I want to get into some real world applications here. This is a, well, it's not a real world picture, it's a cartoon, I'll admit that. Uh, this comes out of one of the lectures by uh, Christensen, uh, a cartoon version of what the Earth looks like cut away. We have the part where we live, we have a crust that's by and large not conducting. And we have these little plumes here. Uh, one of these must be Hawaii. There's a big plume there. If you saw over here, there'd be another plume that goes up to a spot where I live, the world's largest supervolcano, Yellowstone, uh, bubbling up underneath us. Um, but that's really just transporting heat. It doesn't add to the, uh, the thermal, the uh, conductivity. So essentially, we have no currents flowing through there. B is, is uh, curl free. Within the co liquid core, we have a fluid. Okay, this is liquid. And this is what I worked out. The Reynolds number is 10 million. So it's going to be a turbulent uh, fluid if it has a source of driving. Uh, it does have a source of driving. Inside, there is a solid core. Okay, this is actually just iron that has solidified out of this liquid molten iron. And that solidification adds heat, which I was told for a long time was the source of the turbulence. Now I'm being told it's probably the fact that when the iron solidifies out, it leaves behind some lighter elements like silicon, which basically means the stuff that's just been left behind has a lower density. Whether it's hotter or just has a different chemical composition, it has a lower density at the bottom and therefore swirls around. This is our dynamo. Essentially, there is where we have our complex fluid, and it's generating a current. So the curl of B is J. It's some current. And as we've seen, that comes about from the stretching of the magnetic field lines and the amplification. So we will get a complicated field within the core, but we live out here. And so here's the trick. We can say, well, if B is curl free, I can write it as the gradient of a scalar. But I better ensure that div B is equal to 0. So that scalar has to satisfy Laplace's equation. So we have to satisfy Laplace's equation in the, the uh, non-conducting sorry, mantle here, the crust, the mantle. Uh, and this is more graduate level physics, but the solution to Laplace's equation can be written in general as a sum over spherical harmonics. Spherical harmonics are written YLM. A lot of geophysicists prefer to break this out into Legendre polynomials and other terms, cosines and sines. But I like the physics notation. It's a little more concise, and it hides stuff that we really don't care that much about. Um, I'll, I'll just do a little review here. But the magnetic field is the gradient of this. So it's related to this as well. Let's just do a quick refresher for those whose memory of spherical harmonics is kind of rusty. Uh, we have the spherical harmonic expansion is in terms of two indices, L and M. L is the important one. L equals 1, the very first term in that expansion, is the dipole term. This is the, this is the term that generates what we call the dipole magnetic field. The 0, 1, or 1, 0, if you read from bottom to top, Spherical harmonic is proportional to cosine. The 1 and plus and minus is sine of theta, and then a complex exponential, which gives me sines and cosines of phi. So the spherical harmonics are complex. That means the coefficients had better be complex to give me a real answer. And they, can compo they are composed of a real part and an imaginary part. I can write as G and H. This is the traditional notation in geophysics and solar physics, for that matter. Uh, these three components, G10, G11, and H11, are the three coefficients that multiply my dipole contributions. They are related to, not identical to, what you would call the dipole moment, which is a vector with three components, mu x, mu y, and mu z. Uh, so the three of these, three of these. That's the dipole, but it's just the first term in this infinite series. The quadrupole, 
as, well, there's a cosine 2 theta term. I've drawn another one here that's sine of theta. And then sines and cosines of 2 phi. Okay, So when you count them all up, you're going to have five components. These are related to the quadrupole tensor. That is a symmetric traceless tensor. It has five independent coefficients. So that's the quadrupole. That's the L equals 2 term. As we go to higher Ls, we basically get things that have cosine of L theta and sine and cosine of L phi. So when I get to a particular value of L, my spherical harmonic roughly is going to have L periods as I go around a circle, if I choose the circle correctly. Here are some versions of L equals 5. So you go plus, minus, plus, minus, and then the south pole is a plus. And then you keep going back. Uh, here you go plus, minus, plus. You get the idea. The higher L is, the more waves you get in a sphere, in a circle. So the, the finer the scale is. OK. The, the most important thing is in this expansion, which has an infinite number of coefficients, we get YLMs. And they depend on radius inversely with L. So when I have L equals 1, the field goes as 1 over R cubed. A dipole magnetic field goes as 1 over distance cubed. A quadrupole magnetic field goes as 1 over distance to the fourth. An octopole magnetic field, 1 over distance to the fifth. Hexadecipole, that's 16. Six. Right? So as you go further from the center, this factor here is going to get small with distance faster for higher order multiples. This is the take home message. Here are the G's and L's. Well, this is actually written as power for the Earth. Here is what we see at the surface. We see a big dipole. We see a quadrupole, an octopole, hexadecimal. They, but their amplitude decreases, just as it says it would here. Okay? So the magnetic field at the Earth's surface is dominated by dipole with a little bit of quadrupole mixed in. That is not because the dynamo is generating a dipole magnetic field. Because we're way up here, the dynamo is working down here. If we look at the same thing here, the dipole is a little bit bigger. Basically, all of the L's are about the same. It generates a magnetic field that's very complicated. Okay? This should be. Geophysicists use N. I'm using the physics notation. This is L. Same thing. Um, so this is what the Earth's magnetic field looks like. Okay. Uh, red is magnetic field coming out outward, out radially outward. Blue is magnetic field going inward. Probably looks a lot more complicated than you're expecting. That's because I'm plotting it at the core mantle boundary. I'm plotting it at the dynamo. This is the magnetic field that the Earth's core is generating. It is not a simple magnetic field. It has lots of structure. Okay, and what has happened is as I go outward, and I'm going to sweep. Here we have a little cartoon version of the Earth. There's the, the mantle in blue. Sorry, the core in blue. Lighter blue is the mantle. And as I go outward, I'm going to plot the same thing, and you're going to see it gets far simpler. That was this, ex this thing I just explained, that as you go out, this factor here gets smaller and smaller as L gets bigger and bigger. Pretty soon, you're stuck with just L equals 2 and maybe a little bit of L equals 3. Uh, sorry, L equals 1 and a little bit of L equals 2. Dipole and quadrupole. So we're fooled at the surface because we're so far from the dynamo. We don't actually get to see the magnetic field the Earth is generating because we're too far away from it. OK. That is the Earth. And yeah. So what you're seeing is the radius that I'm plotting the magnetic field at. So if you follow that or you follow this, this tells you that I'm plotting. This has gone actually out below, above the surface. This is what you see. So it goes from 0 0.55, which is the radius of the core mantle boundary, to 1.25. And then this is the surface that I'm plotting 
That's, does everyone follow that? Which expands outward. As, as you go further and further from the core, okay? So as you, as R increases here, this ratio decreases, and I'm raising it to higher, I'm raising it to different powers. The higher power I raise something to, if it's less than one, the smaller it will be. So it is, the answer is dominated by the lowest L's. The L equals one and L equals two are the dominant ones. And if you plot a, a field that just has L equals one and L equals two, you get something like this. Looks like a dipole that's kind of slightly deformed. Right? So it's mostly just coming out of somewhere in the south southern hemisphere and going back in, so positive here, negative up here where it's going back in to around the northern hemisphere. And then this is where the field is perfectly horizontal. Yeah. Yes. Ah, we'll get to that in a second, how it changes over 100 years. Um, this, is, this is 100 years ago. I, I happen to just have my hands on a simple data file I pulled off the web that has the spherical harmonics going back 100 years. Um, they go back a little further than this. The spherical harmonics were developed actually for this. You learn about them in quantum mechanics, but they were developed for the Earth's magnetic field by a guy named Carl Frederick Gauss who was trying to understand the Earth's magnetic field. And by then, they'd measured it on the surface in many places. In fact, that's the only place we measure it. Right? They extrapolate downward. So that's why they take the data here, and then they divide by these increasingly small numbers to get this. Uh, I'm not sure I can tell you how much to believe those numbers, but uh, you'll have to get a real expert for that. But we have the data over time, so we can look at what happens to the Earth's magnetic field over time. And so far, that's what's happened, 110 years. That's what's happened so far. Not all that exciting. Um, but as we said, the real source of the magnetic field is down at the core. So let's look what happens to the same magnetic field at the same time for that magnetic field. And you see it doing quite complex things. In fact, it's being moved around by the convection so what you can do is take this induction equation. Well, turns out it's a little too much to ask to work with this exactly. So we're going to assume that the flow is very subsonic, and it is. Uh, and therefore, divergence of V is, is 0. Uh, and also, we're really only interested in it at a surface. So we're only going to look at the radial component. We're also going to ignore the diffusion, just because otherwise the problem is too difficult to solve. And with that, you can, you do know the radial magnetic field and its gradients. So you can solve for the velocity. This is the velocity of what we think the core is doing at the core mantle boundary. We see these interesting flow patterns. There are little arrows around here. I should mention the typical velocity, say there, is about a th what's this? Uh, a third of a millimeter per second. Not exactly as slow as I would have thought. It's, in fact, over the course of a hundred years, that's moved a, a thousand kilometers. You can see actually this little back in. Uh, let's see which one is this. I can't. I can barely read these. This is 1910 or something like that. But you can see a little blob of negative polarity in the southern hemisphere, sphere, which is sort of, you know, it, shouldn't, it doesn't know at the core mantle boundary that it's supposed to be mostly north-south. So that has moved at about 1,000 kilometers. You can see where that moved over to basically from there to right on the, the coast of South America. In fact, it's that little bit of flow in the core and the magnetic field that's being moved by it that generates something we know as the South Atlantic anomaly. That's why the magnetic field over the South Atlantic is in a di in the at the surface is weaker. Uh, and that's sorry, 
would be at the end, you can see that weak spot moving. And it's moved 1,000 kilometers in our last century. Um, now finally, we'll do the uh, long, longer term evolution here. And that is going to be, yeah, uh, the magnetic field. The way we have records that go back 100 years is people had magnet magnetometers, things that could measure the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, 40 million years ago, we did not have those. <laughs> what we have is lava that has cooled and has frozen in magnetization from what the Earth's magnetic field was 40 million years ago. But it doesn't tell us the strength. It tells us the direction. But we have a dynamo that works in two modes, just like our toy. Essentially, the normal mode, normal because it's the mode we're used to today, where the magnetic field comes out of the South Pole and goes up to the North Pole, and the reverse mode, where the dipole is in the opposite orientation. And remember, this is just one of the infinite number of terms that the, dipole, that the dynamo is generating, the dipole term. Somehow, we're really only focused on one of those numbers. That is, what is the component, the north-south orientation of that component? But if we look at it, it has actually changed as we go from today, normal, then some 300,000 years ago, it was reversed, then normal, reversed. You see, it changes quite frequently, although not <laughs> periodically. It's a very poor AC generator. The dynamo apparently is an AC generator. It works in two modes, and it flips back and forth between them. But here, it seems to almost be flipping a coin to decide <laughs> when to flip. Uh, and that is our evolution over 120 million years. So it, seem, it seems like it's just flipping at random. I will, I will do one last thing to do with the geodynamo. And that is the simulations, which were done by Gary Glatzmeyer. He was a graduate student in Colorado, but here at the High Altitude Observatory did his thesis with Peter Gilman on the dynamo of the sun. And he graduated and decided he could use the exact same equations, and that's my point here, to solve for the dynamo of the Earth. And this is some of the best modeling we have of the Earth's dynamo. And it solves the numerical, the MHD equations numerically. These are the field lines. You can more or less see with your eye where the core mantle boundary is. Everything outside of that is this multipolar field. Everything inside of that is what his simulation is generating. It's very complicated. And what you'll see is it mostly goes not north-south, not south-north. It mostly goes east-west, toroidal. The magnetic field, and remember, that's what I said, the rotation of the Earth, which is extremely dominant here, prefers to line up stretching directions in the toroidal direction, perpendicular to the rotation. So it stretches all its magnetic field in that direction, most of its magnetic field, I should say. Uh, so the magnetic field inside the Earth is not the one we see. But of course, in, if you have any experience with, with um, spherical harmonics, you'll know there are no spherical harmonics that do this, that go toroidally around. I can't get the gradient of a scalar to go around that circle because it wouldn't be a singular, single valued scalar. So this field can only exist where there are currents, and that's in the core. So we don't see most of the Earth's magnetic field. We see the stuff that generates spherical harmonics. Let's take a couple minute break here uh, and get back in about, uh, I'd say about three or four minutes if you want to run to the bathroom or stretch your legs or something, because it's hard to keep going for so long. Uh, and see what we think might be happening in some of these other planets. And actually, Ganymede is a moon. The moon is a moon. Uh, and in, let's skip Mercury. I want to focus. We've already talked about the Earth extensively. Venus and Mars have a liquid iron core. So we have our conducting fluid, where we do not have a dynamo in either Venus or Mars. They don't have a large scale magnetic field. So of our ingredients, what do you suppose is missing? They do have a conduct, 
conducting fluid. Yeah. It's right. There's, they're, they're lacking that turbulence, that vigorous turbulence. And you'll see they don't have a solid core. So the thing that was driving the Earth's magnetic field, uh, the dynamo, was the, uh, the condensation. That does not seem to be happening here. Uh, I think, and here I'm way outside of my field of expertise, that um, that explains why neither of these planets is that volcanically active either. Earth is quite volcanically active. Speaking as one who lives on a super volcano, I can attest to that. Uh, let's skip uh, Moon, same story. So Venus, Mars, Moon, the magnetic field may have been there in the past. This kind of thing, the dynamo may have been there in the past. This kind of thing was probably happening differently a long time ago. And the rocks themselves have frozen in remnants of those magnetic fields. Jupiter and Saturn, to a lesser extent, have this metallic helium or hydrogen. Helium and hydrogen, very good conductor. Uh, they are the, the uh, turbulence is being generated there by, uh, I think, by nuclear reactions. Uh, and Uranus and Neptune actually have ionized water ice. Water, sorry, that is a uh, conductor. So let's just skip over to, here are similar kinds of plots for Jupiter, the Jovian magnetic field coming out of the south, going into the north, Saturn. Neptune, you can see, is very complicated. That tells us what? Do some dynamos generate complicated magnetic fields and some generate, in this story I've told you, the Earth generates only a dipole? It's closer to the surface, yeah. Our liquid, our liquid is closer to the surface, yeah. And Mars, we've just got the rocks that have been frozen in place. I want to skip through, just mention here, this idea of the saturation of the dynamo can come to some real use if you figure that the power that's driving the turbulence, which is the thermal conduction, something that's basically moving uh, heat through or density through and creating turbulence, is being balanced by the ohmic dissipation, then in Christensen's chapter of volume three, you can actually work out what the field strength of each planet should be as a function of this factor that basically the thermal conduction to the two-thirds power and the density of the material to the one-third power, and then some dimensionless factors, which you can never get out of this game. But depending on where you put Saturn's uh, core, you can actually get it to fall on the line. But you have stronger magnetic fields at Jupiter because you have stronger driving. Okay, So uh, that all works out pretty well. We're going to have to zoom a little fast here because I want to cover the sun. Uh, which, as I said, is all conducting. Okay? It's, a, it's an ionized plasma, so with very few exceptions, it's a very good conductor. It has very strong turbulence driven thermally by the heat moving out of the, uh, out of the sun. Um, it is an extremely good conductor. Uh, an ionized plasma is about the best conductor you could ask for. Your ions and your electrons are independent of one another and are free to respond to any electric field you put in. The only rub is the rotation isn't all that effective. It's not rotating that fast for its size, so the Rossby number is only 0.01. So the organization is imperfect at best. Uh, one other thing I'll point out, the corona, this outer envelope here, is a very good conductor, but it, there's very little material, and that means the current is going to be, you're not going to have a lot to carry the current. So in some cases, it will be helpful to approximate the magnetic field out there as being current free. And that's a, an approximation we make. All right, so, but based on this, these numbers here, the sun should have a magnetic field, and lo and behold, it does. Here is one of our routine tools. It's called a magnetogram. And it's a map of the sun's magnetic field, just the component pointing towards you. It uses circular polarization of a uh, spectral line to do that. And where it's white, the magnetic field is coming towards you. Where it's black, it's going away from you. And you can see a lot of magnetic field. You can see it doesn't look at all like a dipole. The thing that's generating the turbulence is only the outer layer of the sun. 
this outer 200,000 kilometers. Everything's a conductor, but that's the only part where the generation is happening. So we see a very complicated magnetic field because we're seeing where it's being generated. I tell many people that while we've known about the Earth's magnetic field for a long time, we are so far from the dynamo that what we've, a lot of what we've learned about dynamos we've learned from the sun. We're far away from the sun, but we can see the dynamo directly. Uh, where you see sunspots, and this is just a normal image, and you see these little blemishes are sunspots, that's where you see very strong magnetic field. But you also see magnetic field all sorts of other places. I want to just draw your attention to the fact that this tells us, the sunspots, the concentration, that the sun generates magnetic field that is fibril. Right? The picture you should have is that this sunspot pair, which has magnetic field in it, what we call an active region, was generated in that outer 200,000 kilometer convection zone and has poked through the surface. But basically the magnetic field was going from the east to the west up here, so positive, negative, and then down here from the west to the east going the other way. But it's part of a, a long strand of magnetic field that was generated down there. And you will also notice if you look carefully and you look at lots of these, that it's generally the case that the northern hemisphere has magnetic field going one way. In this case, it is east to west. And the south, southern hemisphere, the opposite way. So we have magnetic field that's mostly toroidal. I argued that in the Earth's magnetic field, what simulations tell us is that's probably true of the Earth's magnetic field. Here, we've known for 100 years that the sun's magnetic field does this. It's mostly east-west and west-east, north and south hemisphere. And that just comes from observing all this data, identifying that this magnetic field is structured like that. Um, so here is that same kind of image. And what I've done here is unwrapped it. I had to wait for the sun to rotate uh, a full rotation, 27 days, so I can see all parts of it. And I unwrapped it, and I sort of compromised the resolution. One of the reasons I did this was I could put one magnetic field up here and another down here. This is the Earth's magnetic field at the core mantle boundary. This is the Sun's magnetic field where I've thrown away most of the spherical harmonics, thrown away most of the data. Observers will tell you not to do this, just to make the game fair. We don't have a lot of spherical harmonics for the Earth's magnetic field. Now you see. Boy, they're not that different. <laughs> right? We here, graduate students in space physics, could pick these two out of a lineup. I think if you brought this out to uh, a man on the street and said, whose magnetic field is whose, they might puzzle. Right? They don't look all that different. Now, here's a dynamo that operates at a magnetic Reynolds number of 10 to the 8 and a Rossby number of 10 to the minus 2. Magnetic Reynolds number of 10 to the 2, Rossby number of 10 to the minus 6. I would argue that's the biggest difference. Not that the sun is hot or the Earth has a, a superabundance of Starbucks outlets. It's really the Rossby number and the Reynolds number. And th that's what leads to the differences. For the Earth's magnetic field, for the Sun's magnetic field, it's the outside region that we expect to have very little current, maybe no current. And a very common way to approximate this is that it's current free and use exactly the same trick. We're going to say that it's a gradient of a scalar. and solve for the multipole expansion of the magnetic field. And that allows us to figure out what the magnetic field is out, outside. And when we do that, we actually find that these spherical harmonics, which generate a very complicated structure at the solar surface, by the time I get to 2 and a half solar radii, and I've let them be dominated, I mostly get a dipole magnetic field. And here I'm plotting the radial magnetic field. This is a so-called source surface model. Uh, and this is a very common format for plotting this. The magnetic field is positive here and negative here, uh, going out of the sun here and into the sun here. This is exactly the same time as that. So you can see all that structure is contained in Ls that when I go far away, they mostly, their contributions mostly dis disappear. But this is not a perfect uh, 
This is not a perfect dipole. It's obviously got some of the quadrupole in it. Um, and what happens over time, this is a much closer to a, a regular dipole, the magnetic field coming out of the southern hemisphere, or sorry, coming out of the northern hemisphere and going into the southern hemisphere, as it was in 1996. And then, as we go along in time, the different multipole components are evolving and they change, and then the dipole moment is reversed. And so by 2008, we have the magnetic field coming out of the south and going into the north. So while we're having to rely on lava to show us how this happens for the Earth, or the Sun, we see it happen. We see the Earth's magnetic field, the Sun's magnetic field switch. Here is a plot I made using these spherical harmonics. This down here is the well-known sunspot number. Remember those sunspots were related to the magnetic field and in 1980, we had a lot of sunspots, 86, not so many, 90, a lot, 96, 97, not so many. They go up and down. Here is the dipole moment of the sun. This is, in green, is the magnitude of the dipole. Okay, it's a vector, so I'm just plotting the magnitude, and it sort of stays there. It gets stronger during solar maximum, but the red, and then the fit is the blue, is just the z component of that dipole. So you can see here that the dipole was pointed in one way back in 1985, and it's pointed in the other way when there are very few sunspots. Then, with all those sunspots, the magnetic dipole gets very confused. It actually doesn't go away. It just points off to some side, so there's no z component. Uh, on March 6, 1990, the z component has disappeared. And then it's flipped over, and we have a magnetic field, a dipole that's pointed mostly north-south. So you can see where the blue joins the green. That's where the dipole orientation is north-south. It wants to be south-north or north-south, back and forth. Um, when you look at the source surface model, when we have very few sunspots, and the dipole is more or less north-south, then we have one of these source surface models where the magnetic field is mostly coming out of the northern hemisphere and going back down into the southern hemisphere. When it's flipping, that's at solar maximum, the dipole is almost zero, but that doesn't mean the magnetic field is, is weak. It's actually very strong, but it's dominated here, you can see, by a quadrupole, plus, minus, plus, minus. That's sort of part of the same plot. So four poles. That's what's happening to it. And so it's, it's nice to think of it as a dipole, but you get into these complicated situations where uh, well, I don't have, yeah, over here, 2012 or so, people said, oh, the magnetic field has reversed on the sun, except only the north pole has reversed. <laughs> right? So we have plus in the north pole and plus in the south pole. Is that possible? That's actually an L equals 2, M equals 0 quadrupole. Right? So, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not as, it's a dumb way to, to express it in terms of the dipole. That's what happened to the sun. It basically, its dipole moment disappears and the quadrupole moment is still there. And it's very big and complex. Uh, so this gives you an idea that the sun's dynamo, well, this gives you an even better idea. Now we go back to the 1870s. We did not make magnetograms in 1870, but people were counting sunspots. So we kind of know that the, Earth's the sun's magnetic field was strong, weak, strong, weak. Now, whenever it's weak, that's when it's mostly a dipole. Uh, but we can go back in time. We can also see this is where the sunspots occur. This is 50 to 30 degrees north. Yeah, 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south. They mostly appear between 30 degrees north and south, just along the equator. This is a consequence of the Rossby number being lower, higher. I hate that. Higher for the sun. The Earth's magnetic, the Earth's dynamo operates at a Rossby number of 10 to the minus 6. So the rotation is so strong that it basically prevents the magnetic field from appearing anywhere at the core. It tends to prefer the north and south. 
Here we have a lower Rossby number. It prefers the equators. Uh, this is a version of that diagram. But when we actually know the magnetic field strength, here it's positive, here it's negative. The sunspots are positive and negative, but it turns out that the opposite sign heads off to the poles and reverses the poles. So when the whole thing flips over, this is the dipole moment taking over. Here, where we have plus and minus. Here, where we have minus and plus. And that comes from the dipole as a whole. Um, this is going back even further in time. We actually have records of sunspots that are not as routine, but are pretty reliable back to 1600. We have periods where it looks like the dynamo was operating at a much weaker level. We don't know that it shut off. We know that it wasn't forming sunspots. The relationship between sunspots and magnetic field is a complicated one. We can't get into that here. But we do think that for about 50 years, that dynamo was not so active. Uh, you can also see as an AC generator, it's not a great AC generator, but it's not random like the Earth. That's the consequence of operating at a Reynolds number of 10 to the 10 rather than 10 to the 7. We're much higher Reynolds number. Our turbulence is much better developed. We get a much better AC signal. So it's the outer envelope, the convecting envelope, that generates magnetic fields in the sun. What about other stars? And here is, if you took any astronomy, a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. X-axis is basically the temperature of a star. The Y-axis is the brightness of that star. Absolutely not how bright it is in the sky. Uh, and the what we call main sequence stars all fall on this curve here, which is cool, dim stars and bright, hot stars. And the sun is right about here. We're a G-type star. Now, the amazing thing is as you go to hotter and hotter stars, the convective envelope, there for the sun is a convective envelope that's about one third, two thirds not convecting. As you go to the cool stars, the whole star becomes convective. As you go to the hotter stars, the outer envelope is not convective anymore, and we don't have any, we, uh, the, the core could be slightly convective, but uh, the envelope itself is not. You look at the size of the convection zone as a function of temperature. You have stars that get smaller as the temperature gets. You'll see, as an, a, a good astronomer should, I plotted the axis in reverse. So high temperatures are on the left and low temperatures are on the right. 4,000 Kelvin, essentially fully convective. Our sun here, G5, sort of the outer. And so this is also the outer portion of the star is convective and not the inner portion. And then by the time you get into the F, you have no convection zone at all. Those are fully radiative, no convection zone. So in the real data, you see that over that range from F stars right about here out to M stars, the cooler stars, these are magnetically active. These have magnetic fields, just like the sun does. The hot stars, no magnetic field. They don't have a convective envelope, no, no turbulence, no magnetic field. And you can actually measure that by measuring something known as the uh, calcium H index, or HK flux, H and K index. And this is, again, a function of spectral type. There's F. You basically get no signature of magnetic fields if you're hotter than an F star. And you get some magnetic field as you go hotter. The guiding number here is a combination of the Reynolds number and the magnetic Reynolds number, known as the dynamo number. It actually ends up, if you have to do all the approximations that astronomers do, you can't really figure out a lot of these numbers exactly. So you assume that they scale in various ways with the rotation rate of the star. And what you find is the dynamo number, the strength of this dynamo, should scale as the Rossby number, inversely. So the smaller the Rossby number is, the faster the star is rotating, the stronger the dynamo should be, which is what we see. Here is the Rossby number, and here is the strength of the magnetic field. 
This is a log of the ROSB number. So large ROSB numbers are over here. And as you get smaller and smaller, you get stronger and stronger magnetic fields. Okay? So you do see what you expect to see, that when the star both has a convective envelope and it's rotating so that it's organizing its, its turbulent magnetic field, you see magnetic fields coming out of stars. So a whole class of stars, but not all stars, are generating their own magnetic fields the same way as the sun. And that's just different data showing the same thing. So more or less on time, I'll just summarize that what we've talked about today is just answering, or in the morning, is just answering why the sun and the earth have magnetic fields. And the simple answer is they all have dynamos. They have a conducting fluid. It's undergoing complex motion. And it has enough oomph, enough kick, to create a dynamo. Uh, it creates complex fields, not simple dipole fields. The only reason you see a simple dipole field is you're far from where it's generating the complex field. But it, you know, you're generating the field with turbulence. You can't expect a simple thing to come out of it. Nothing simple comes out of turbulence. Uh, and it evolves in time. We see these reversals. We see reversals in the Earth's magnetic field. We see reversals in the Sun's magnetic field. Uh, they happen for the same reason. They're, they have different histories. Basically, the differences in those dynamos and all the rest of the dynamos really you summarize in terms of the basic parameters that go into all of this. The magnetic Reynolds number, the Reynolds number, the Rossby number. You know those. You know a lot about your dynamo. Is it made of metal, hydrogen? Doesn't matter. Tell me the Reynolds number. Tell me the magnetic Reynolds number. Tell me the Rossby number. I can tell you a lot about the dynamo. All right. I think it's time for lunch. Any questions, though? I know this is a lot to digest, but uh, hopefully it won't have been the first time you've ever heard that the Earth has a magnetic field. Yeah? Yes. There, so I'm going over the top of, of fields that are all very complicated. So you have to go into the details of how the solar dynamo works. Uh, and to sort of duck out of your question, there are the way you often tell non-scientists is, we don't know. We as scientists know, actually, we know lots of answers to that question. We just don't know which is right. So there are people in this building who could tell you exactly why that's true. And then you go three offices down, and someone else will tell you exactly why that's true. And they'll be different. So we're still learning the explanations for that. Uh, Andres Munoz will be here for the uh, workshop on Monday for the symposium. And he's worked on that quite a bit. He will tell you his, his version. But it really has to do with the details of the way the sun's dynamo flows are working. That, that much we do know. Um, but it's a good question. Yeah, and, and Doug Bisecker will tell you what it's like to have to predict that into the future. Because there are reasons we want to know. Will cycle 25 be stronger than cycle 24 or weaker? There's, there's real money on that uh, outcome. There's also bar bets on the outcome, but uh, like real commercial interests saying, tell me how strong this solar cycle will be. Doug will explain that. And also tell you, boy, if he knew which theory was right, they'd be in business. They don't. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We, uh, the way it happens is the, is the um, nuclear fusion itself creates a strong enough uh, temperature gradient that it drives convection. Very, very hot stars. The core is convective, and it's actually where the nuclear reactions are going on. But what's the consequence? Is that generating a magnetic field? You're asking the wrong guy. I, I don't know if people are saying whether it does or not. Would there be any observable consequences to such a magnetic field? given how hard it is to observe anything on a star that's not our sun. Uh, my knowledge is, is there are some indications that they have large-scale dipolar magnetic fields. A stars, in particular, are known to have that. But they, you, you would already know they'd be very simple, as opposed to these other stars, where, this, where the magnetic field is very, is very complex. 
So it's the, the way we observe it, I didn't go into all the details, I don't even understand all the details, is really by its signature of what I'm going to talk about this afternoon on the transition region. If you have a, if you have a magnetic field, it turns out you have a corona and therefore you have a transition region which generates all these really cool spectral lines, that will tell you a lot about the transition region, which will tell you about the magnetic field. That's what they're observing. They're observing the shape of the calcium emission. Absorption lines, sorry. Absorption lines of calcium, but that's affected by the magnetic field. So you can't figure out how complicated it is. You can just tell how much there is of it. For A stars and B stars, you actually can see the polarization. So that's a big dipole consistent with a field that's generated far away from the surface. Not, we'll break for lunch, get back here and talk about why there's a corona and why there's a transition region. Or a solar wind, sorry, as well. All right, enjoy your lunch.